Wow. Look at this audience. Look at you all. Distinguished and very proud guests, fabulous faculty and staff, and most importantly, the extraordinary first-year medical students here. I am profoundly honored and grateful to be here with you all today. You all definitely, definitely chose the right school. Here you have all these visionary leaders. They're all innovators and fierce champions of education and equity. Deeply attuned to the needs and well-being of students, unafraid to take on the world to ensure that you get all the training you deserve and that your patients get all the care they deserve. I am alive because of Icon Mount Sinai. My grandparents came to the US from Mezhbish, Ukraine in the 1920s to escape poverty, persecution, and pogroms, which are ethnic massacres of Jewish people. They settled on the Lower East Side. My grandfather operated a pushcart. Grandma worked in a sweatshop. In 1928, my father, their two-year-old son, was hospitalized with empyema, an infection around his left lung. Penicillin had just been discovered and wasn't yet available. The doctors told my grandparents all they could do was transfer him to a hospital for terminally ill people. But my grandparents, both barely five feet tall, had another idea. They stood outside his hospital room armed with two large sticks blocking the entrance to his room. Meanwhile, my father's 10-year-old sister raced around the neighborhood, borrowing enough money to transport him to the only hospital they knew would absolutely care for a poor Jewish kid, Mount Sinai. At Mount Sinai, Howard Lilienthal, who had recently performed the very first pulmonary lobectomy for inflammatory disease, and Charles Ellsberg, who had just pioneered a successful method of anesthesia, operated on him. Welcome all to the place that saved his life. A place that continues to value the lives of all people, regardless of who they are or where they come from. A place that saved lives by, ere by erecting a hospital in Central Park during COVID. I don't know if any of you saw it, it was absolutely amazing. A place that wins award for being the most diverse and equitable, the most innovative, and for providing the very best clinical care. And welcome to our physician family. You are medicine's future leaders, healers, innovators, and change agents. One of the beauties of our profession lies in its endless possibilities. Our roles and our focus change over time. So I can't say much about what your careers will look like, and with the speed medicine and science are evolving, even those of you who feel like you have a very clear path may find your careers quite different than what you envision them right now. Instead, I would like to share with you all what others have generously taught me about how to be a good doctor. I don't need to tell you all about the massive challenges we're facing as doctors and as a society, but if Shirley and James a former Black Panther and community research partner were here, she'd tell you all, you can't wring your hands and roll up your sleeves at the same time. In the wake of George Floyd's murder, we rolled up our sleeves. Dean Charney and our CEO commissioned a task force on racism to take an unflinching look at our own organization, to move beyond documenting the magnitude of inequities and implement initiatives to transform our operations, education, and care. We are succeeding, just as you all will, by identifying and mobilizing collective strengths and assets. Jack Geiger, a mentor and founder of two Nobel Prize winning physician organizations, taught me about positive disruption. In the 60s, as a doctor in rural Mississippi, he was trying to care for his patients who were sick because they couldn't afford to eat. What would you do? Jack billed the local government pharmacy for their food bills. 
When a government official noticed and challenged him, you know what he said? Last time I looked at my textbook, the specific therapy for malnutrition was food. That was the genesis of the food stamps movement and of food stamps in our country. His work inspires me, and I hope it inspires you all to be creative, fearless, and be strategic to best serve our patients. Cesar Vasquez, a local educator who led our East Harlem Partnership for Diabetes Prevention, emphasized collaboration and having each other's backs. Cesar would have you consider the following. You all got here in part because you outshined others, right? It's competitive getting into med school. But medicine, now you're here, it's a team sport. Are you more creative alone or when you bounce ideas off people? Who has insights and experiences that complement yours? As researchers, some of our best ideas come from people living in the communities which are most disproportionately and unjustly impacted by illness. The partnership Caesar led conceptualized and co-developed the program Dean Muller was talking about, a peer-led program that effectively and inexpensively prevents diabetes used around the world now. Who are you going to solicit ideas from? Who are you going to work with to implement them? As clinicians, when you walk onto the labor and delivery unit, realize that the nurses there know more than most of us ever will about childbirth. They and nurses everywhere are our teachers, not just our assistants. Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor visited with your predecessors here in 2015. She led by example. Before she met with the med students, she insisted on meeting with and thanking all the staff who helped set up and manage her visit. She knows what and who it takes to make great things happen. And as you're going to be highly regarded and compensated professionals, you know what CSU would say to you all? Make sure my community has access to the power that your white coats afford. Alberta Slappy, former president of the Tenants Association of the Low Income Housing Complex, right across the street from where you all will take your classes, would often remind me, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. For example, our colleague Sari Reisner, a leader in transgender health, after reading articles how gender dysphoria is bad for health, chose to conduct research on how gender euphoria is good for health. At Mount Sinai, we formed a task force to take a fresh look at algorithms and technologies we use in everyday clinical care to make sure they don't harbor biases that can harm patients. Pulse oximeters that measure oxygen at the tip of our fingers, you might have seen a lot of them around during COVID. They were not developed for or adequately tested on people with different levels of melanin in their skin. This led to people of color getting inadequate care. We are working with engineers to build new, more accurate machines that work for everyone. Ms. Slappy would ask you all to stay curious and open to new solutions. When I was a med student, my little grandma, with her sixth grade education, called me every single week to ask me what I was learning. This regularly reminded me of the privilege I have to study medicine. We hope you not only consume the knowledge we impart, but also produce new approaches and solutions us old timers haven't even dreamed of. Finally, Wendy Levinson, a medical educator, taught me and would suggest that you mine for gold, find common ground with each and every patient. Even ones you don't particularly like and ones who push all your buttons, and some will push all your buttons. Even one thing, like a sports team you all root, both root for. Remember, your bad day as a doctor will pale in comparison to what most of your patients are going through. Hume Connection is a key to understanding what your patients want and need. And it infuses joy in even the most difficult situations. So building out what Wendy taught me, enjoy that gorgeous gold you all uncover. I have no doubt that you'll find meaning in triumphs of diagnoses and of treatments. 
you'll also find it in the simple act of being present for your patients. We asked doctors across the US to write about what reaffirms their commitment to practicing medicine. We were surprised that most stories take place in settings typically associated with failure, like death and progressive chronic illness. One oncologist wrote about seeing in a patient who he'd been treating for cancer. I spoke to her. The end is coming soon. Do you have anything you need to say? She opened her eyes and said, honey, I love you. And I said, I love you too. And she cried and I cried while I held her hand. This was one of the most meaningful moments in his career. When my father became ill in his 70s, he came back to Sinai for his care. I remember the first time his geriatrician, Sean Morrison, was listening to his lungs. He gently touched the large scar across my father's back and asked him where it came from. My father, who had Alzheimer's, didn't remember, but I did. When my father died, the first person I saw at the synagogue was my partner and mentor, Caesar. He'd never been to anything Jewish, and he did not come inside the building. He traveled all the way to my dad's funeral in the suburbs, so he'd be standing outside as I walked in, making sure that he knew, that I knew, that he always had my back. Entering class of 2023, we all, here and here, we all have your backs. Please remember how important it is to take good care of yourselves. Please take good care of each other. Continue to draw inspiration from all the diverse and incredible individuals who surround you. Look at things in new ways. Recognize and use your newfound power wisely. And find the joy in your work. We need you. The world needs you. And we are excited to witness the remarkable impact each and every one of you will make. Congratulations and welcome to this incredible journey. I hope you enjoy the ride. Thank you.